Good morning. Bonjour. Comme va? Uh, Gruß Gott. Namaste. Uh, konnichiwa. And thank you for joining us, attendees and panelists. Uh, I'm David Satella. I am the president of the Paid Search Association. And welcome to day three, the final day. Um, some will say the best day of the conference. Um, just want to run through a couple slides here. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we really appreciate your attendance. We've had a great time over the past uh, two and a half days, and uh, uh, it's all due to you. I want to thank the sponsors who contributed uh, their hard-earned money to um, make this webinar and uh, our association possible. Microsoft Advertising uh, is a platinum sponsor. That means they kicked in a lot of money. Uh, closed Loop is a great um, agency. They're a gold sponsor. And PPC Additor is a great PPC tool, and they are a gold sponsor as well. I want to thank the speakers as well. These are the speakers that you'll see today. Brad Geddes will be moderating the whole day. Uh, Aaron Levy will be speaking. Frederic Valles. Uh, Jean Paolo, oh my God, I misspelled your name. I'm sorry, Jean Paolo. LaRusso, uh, okay. Virgie will be with okay. us later. <laughs> I can survive this humiliation. <laughs> okay. And Nava Hopkins will be joining us uh, uh, as one of the panelists at the end of the day. And then I wanted to re remind uh, everyone that we have a happy hour following the last hour of Q&A. So if you want to stick around and chat with speakers and board members and other attendees, uh, that should be some fun. Um, unlike the other days, I wanted to list contact information for speakers. Um, some, of the, some of the speakers and panelists and moderators have agreed to uh, let me put up their contact information just because they love to hear from you. And also, uh, I wanted to remind people that, uh, like everyone else on the planet, we're, we're suffering from uh, the monetary and, and uh, mental health issues associated with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, we encourage you to um, contact the speakers and panelists if you're interested in getting help with your PPC or uh, get some great tools that some of the panelists have to offer. I'm going to leave this on the screen for a second so you can write the, this information down and then go to the second one. This will also be included in the recording that we'll make available next week to uh, attendees and registrants. Uh, here's the last slide of contact information. I've listed my name at the bottom again, um, not just because I want you to patronize me, but also because of the fact that if you want to get in touch with someone who hasn't been listed, um, and it's, it could very well be that I've asked for their permission at the last minute, um, send me an email. Uh, if you want to get in touch with one of the speakers or panelists or moderators uh, that hasn't been listed here, and I promise to forward it on to them. Uh, final thanks to the producers of the event, uh, Jean Paolo, this is spelled correctly, LaRusso of AdWorld Experience, uh, Lisa Ressler of Big Click Co., uh, Mike Friedman, who is the executive director of the Paid Search Association. And I'm listed here because you can send me uh, information, uh, you can send me um, suggestions for improving the event in the future. We also want to call out um, the physical conferences that many of you would be attending if it weren't for this pandemic. Um, they are uh, vital members of our PPC community, and uh, we really want to encourage you to. Uh, attend their conferences when they are rescheduled. And um, in the case of SMX, attend their vi virtual conference will be taking place at the beginning of June. So um, HeroConf has not been rescheduled yet. Uh, SMX, as I said, uh, register for their virtual conference. Uh, AdWorld Experience, Jean Paolo's uh, conference has been rescheduled for October. And yes. when, he, when he speaks, he'll uh, They'll give you links and information about how to get involved in that. And then, of course, there is Venerable PubCon, which has not been uh, rescheduled yet. Uh, the Florida Instantiation 
uh, is is kind of in limbo. We're not sure whether it's going to take place or not, um, but we'll, it, it remains to be seen what happens with the Las Vegas version. The uh, participants in this in this uh, conference uh, do get a 20% off membership in the um, Paid Search Association. So if you register with this code PSAC20, uh, you'll get a, a pretty good discount off of membership. And we encourage uh, attendees to join. Um, we are uh, less than a year old and uh, building momentum uh, daily. Uh, this conference is something that uh, has been a labor of love for uh, the, the organizers and, and board of directors of the um, organization. And you'll be seeing uh, much more in the, in the form of resources for education, uh, more webinars, and um, surprises to become. So a little housekeeping. Uh, if you have a question to ask of a speaker during a, um, a, a presentation, use the Q&A feature of Zoom. You'll find it at the bottom of your, of your screen if you hover at the bottom. And then if you click on Q&A, you'll see a popped up um, dialog box that will let you ask questions. Um, on the first day, we disabled chat for attendees because we thought it was important for the speakers and moderators to uh, communicate with each other using chat. And um, we revisited that yesterday. We left it open for attendees. And we'll do that again uh, today. So uh, attendees, please use the Q&A box for asking questions, but if you just want to make comments or uh, communicate with speakers or moderators, then go ahead and feel free to use the chat box. And the last slide I have, uh, we, we neglected to publish our code of conduct for our conference on the uh, conference page. So I'm, uh, I'm displaying it here. Uh, rather than read through it, those of you who are viewing this as a replay can read it. And uh, I am going to let uh, Brad Geddes, who's the moderator for the rest of the day, translate this into human speak. But um, I don't want to make light of this. This is very important to, the, to us. And I think Brad can express it better than even these words can. Yeah. So, so Brad, go ahead. yeah, yeah, just two minutes and then we're going to get to Aaron. But so usually conferences, right? And this is important as we think about more virtual conferences going forward. When people are behind computer screens, they're not visible, although we are right now, um, they're, A, they don't have their human filters on, right? They're not thinking about how people in, understand what I'm saying, what you don't have as much uh, non-visual cues, and people are just honestly a little meaner, right, when they're sort of hidden behind a computer. When you're in person, you get to read the non-visual cues. You see the, oh, my gosh, someone really is not liking this, and, and the face scrunches. We don't, we don't get that. Right? So it's important to think about how your words and actions are taken by others. You know, we're all in a lot of stress these days. So the bullet point list, be nice, don't be a racist, uh, don't harass others, don't use profanity, there's always better words, right? We're all equal, we're all here to learn and spend time with colleagues, right? That's why we're here, right? It is learning. So let's be human, right? The good human side we all have in us, right? Let's all be human and, and just have a good show. All right, it's important, remember it. I'm not gonna harp on it. You're all smart people, you're here today, you're a smart person. Um, so we're gonna accept, you can, you can take it once and put it in the brain and not forget it. So without further ado then, um, kicking us off, looking at how automation works in a time of crisis, which is a really great topic these days, is Aaron Levy. So for those of you who can do virtual claps, right, let's give Aaron a, Aaron a nice clap. And there you go, Aaron, all right, rah, rah. And, and let's welcome Aaron. So Aaron, why don't you share your screen, unmute yourself, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is the hardest part, is making sure we share the right screen, even though everything's closed. Okay. And... That should work. I'm sharing the right, right one, correct? Good. Okay, so, I mean, look, largely I'm gonna be talking about COVID, but there's a reason why I called this uh, automation in times of crisis because this, well, we'll get to it. Um, but in any case, I mean, there's no secret that, that Google, Microsoft, um, 
frankly, every marketing platform now is pitching automation and machine learning. And we're in complicated times. So a brief background on yours truly. Um, you can obviously see my face already, but that's my face bigger and smileier. Um, I oversee a large portion of the SEM team at Tenuity. Uh, I'm actually gonna post on Twitter our brand story shortly. So everybody's like, what does that mean? That's a made up word. Why, what happened? Um, we'll share that because we just had our one year anniversary of our name about two or three days ago. Um, a large part of my role, actually our team meeting is supposed to be right now. So a large portion of my team is now watching. Uh, hi team. Uh, but a large part of my role is focusing on the future. So my team can focus on the now, figure out how to push all the buttons and pull the levers. My job is to worry about three months, six months, a year, two years down the line to make sure that we're all in, in good shape. Uh, I'm a member of the PSA board. I like to play outside a lot. Uh, I impulse painted my room bright green, which was a questionable decision, but is what it is. Uh, okay. So I mentioned before that we are in unprecedented times, if you will. Um, I did a quick search uh, as I'm getting a little sick of hearing the word unprecedented uh, or complicated or all that sort of stuff. Uh, so a quick search of Google News I had about 76 million mentions of unprecedented. It seems a little low to me. Um, but remember when we're talking about automation, uh, specifically with bidding, but frankly with a lot of things, they're not looking at context or emotion or humans, they're looking at data. So I was curious. So I took a look at some of our clients that were, I'll say, you know, less affected by issues like fulfillment or volume or products being banned or things like that, um, and try to take a look and, and see what happened. So this is a brief, uh, view of some data for a large e-commerce retailer, consider it a marketplace. They sell a little bit of everything. One of these represents the last three months worth of data and it shows conversion rate over time, cost per acquisition over time and cost per click over time. One of them shows the last three months, so quarantine. One of them shows the fourth quarter. We can't really do a poll here. So for you know your sake, do yourself and, and do yourself a favor and guess which one is which. Give a brief second so that you can write down your answers and then cross them out when I give you the right answer. Um, so the, you know, what's funny is I don't even remember what the right answer is. Um, the top one is current scenario and bottom is uh, Q4. Tough to tell. Um, so when we're thinking about machine learning or automation, again, these things are not looking at reality. They're not looking at humans. They're not looking at emotions. They are looking at data. So they are seeing conversion rate spikes, CPC drops, CPA spikes and drops. These are the three core factors that smart bidding looks at. So what they look at is just this. So while the times are unprecedented, Marketing in a crisis isn't necessarily about what's going on in the world. Certainly it is to a degree that we're trying to predict human behavior. But when we're thinking about machine learning, automation, things like that, we are thinking about data and how fast it moves and how fast we can get ahead of it and if our systems apply to it. So when we're talking about trying to predict human behavior, which honestly, I've, I've, if I had a different career, it would be a cultural anthropologist because I love trying to figure out what people are going to do. Um, I took a look at one of one of my favorite books that I haven't read in a really long time, but it's called Predictably Irrational. Uh, if you haven't read it, it's a really interesting study, uh, basically about the things that we make decisions about. And there were four core factors in here that I think apply to our you know our crisis scenario, specifically our current crisis scenario. So, number one, human beings are entirely focused on relativity, meaning that we can't generate value of an item on its own. These glasses, I have no idea if they're nice or not. I have no idea if they're bad or not. I have no idea if in a vacuum they're good or not, unless I have another pair of glasses to compare them to. For reference, these are blue light glasses and I bought the cheap ones, which was a mistake. Don't do that, buy the nice ones. Um, but so number one, we need to have something to compare things to to generate value and to drive our decisions. Number two, supply and demand is to a degree arbitrary and pretend. Um, the example that they 
cite in the book is talking about, <clears throat> you know, rare jewels, shiny things. Diamonds are a good example of diamonds aren't really rare. They're kind of everywhere. Uh, we just assign a value because someone told us that they're rare. Um, so it's interesting in the current crisis, you can look at ye old toilet paper um, where all of a sudden toilet paper was richer than gold. I have plenty of toilet paper in my bathroom, but I still went out and bought some. I don't really know why, but it's because of that, that arbitrary demand that was created by arbitrary scarcity. So that's the sort of thing that we can predict as marketers and get ahead of, which we'll talk about. Number three is that social norms uh, are more important than market norms. And this is really interesting, especially with what Brad was talking about with, um, you know, with talking about the code of conduct and how people behave in their home versus when they're at a conference. That's wholly reflected in a crisis and it's wholly, for lack of a better word, normal behavior. That doesn't mean that it's appropriate or not, but it means that we behave how we think our environment dictates we should behave rather than what we know is best. So the example they use here, again, we're thinking about from a messaging perspective, a good example of this is, is State Farm Insurance is like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. You're likely to be more forgiving of a neighbor than you are of a company. So if you treat State Farm like a member of your community, if they make a little mistake, it's, eh, it's okay, they're trying. Um, again, we're in, a, we're in a similar scenario where the companies that message in a way in a crisis that message in a way that reflects, hey, we're doing our best and are transparent versus people who are, you know, wind up virtue signaling or wind up spewing out things that maybe aren't really true or trying to present. There was one brand that said, we lowered our prices to make sure that we're treating people better. No, they're not. You're just having a sale and you rebranded it. Be careful about that. And number four, uh, expectations beget outcomes, meaning that we see what we want to see. Um, we will find, you can also call it confirmation bias. That is whatever expectation we have for an outcome is the one that we will inherently look for and usually find. So what does any of this have to do with automation? So when we're thinking about automation, primarily for, from paid search, it's machine learning, uh, which essentially means that it looks at past things to predict future performance. And then based on the past information it has, it tries to operate based on what it expects out of that. So when we think about it from a search perspective, from the things that we do, there's, there's kind of three different ways that you can look at automation. I'm going to look at three different factors. Some of you may not consider automation, but I do. So first, of course, targeting. Um, second, bidding, budgeting, making sure these things work out. And third, messaging, um, all of which are automated in some degree, uh, which can be a challenge. So we'll talk about targeting keywords first. Uh, I, I teased toilet paper a bit before. So out of curiosity, I went and poked into Google Trends to see what happened. So these are spikes for a number of different things. I actually looked up the trends for recession, which was even more interesting because there were a couple of spikes that kept on falling off. And I was trying to figure out what triggered those. Um, but when you look at things like video chat, everyone Oh my God, how do I do this? How, what am I supposed to do? I don't know what to do. Before realizing they have 11 billion apps on their phone that already do it. Uh, again, masks. People went nuts the second they were mandated. People didn't look for them until they were told to look for them. Hand sanitizer. Again, it was a huge spike. It was a huge crisis. It was that arbitrary demand. And I think the most fascinating for one for me has been home workout stuff. Um, I'm really excited to see what Craigslist looks like after the crisis uh, or whatever version of Craigslist you have in your country. But all the people who made all these things, all these decisions to try and replicate normal because of that scarcity of demand rather than, you know, a little bit of adaptation. So when we're thinking about um, from a targeting perspective, how can we get ahead of this? We can't, obviously we can't predict the future. We can't figure out, you know, what's going to happen without someone else saying it. But what we can do um, I mean, look, the easiest thing to do is to set Google alerts, or I personally use TalkWalker. Um, be a little bit more liberal with the alerts that you would set. A lot of us will have alerts set for our brand terms to see when our clients are talked about. I wouldn't do that. Well, I mean, yes, yeah, still do that. But um, what I would do instead is think about your top products, uh, the top stuff that you, that you sell. Um, look for production problems, because then you might run out of stuff. 
uh, look for mentions in the news of shortages, things like that. Uh, that's how you'll be able to get ahead of what might happen. Uh, number two, uh, we use Brad's tool analysis for this. Uh, I think Frederick is going to talk about some scripts later on, but if you're not familiar with ngrams, ngrams essentially slice out uh, a piece of a query and find language snippets uh, that may be rising or falling. So we would normally run those, you know, for a longer term to find huge outliers. What I would instead recommend doing uh, for both ngrams and regular search queries, run them really frequently for short term, short periods of time and compare them to the short period of time before that. Because what you're going to want to look for is things that are spiking up so that you can get at the beginning of that uplift rather than the end when it's starting to fall off. Uh, and number three, I talked about this a bit before, but monitor your own inventory. Um, number one, if you are having problems getting a product into your warehouse, so are your competitors, that scarcity is going to happen which means that people are gonna start looking for it more. Um, and number two is look at what changes or if there are products that you have sold and haven't sold for a while or things that seem like they're out of season, that is usually a sign that something is happening. And move your face. Uh, number four, Google actually just, I candidly don't know if they just released this or if they've had it forever, but it's a little playpen that they have on Think with Google um, and I'll, tweet these slides out later so you don't have to write it down. <clears throat> but they're showing rising and falling query trends. Uh, again, I think Frederick is going to talk about this. If not, he shared it before. But um, there's a couple of scripts out there to find queries that are showing up that haven't shown up before. So making sure that you stay on top of those to you know, make sure that you get ahead of the trends that are coming at the beginning and the end of the crisis. So dynamic search ads were actually something that we were a little bit worried about. Um, especially as products go in and out of stock or you run out of things or you may or may not be able to buy them. So can you still use them? Yes, but you'll want to be careful about exactly what you want to do. So I took a little screenshot of um, Bed Bath & Beyond's page. So there's a couple things to watch for if you run DSAs. So first of all, all that stuff that you wrote about COVID and curbside pickup and stuff like that is indexed on your site. Uh, number two is you have to make sure that you have a good user experience if you're gonna promote things like curbside pickup. So if I wanted to go buy a nice new stand mixer because I'm all of a sudden a bread baker, uh, turns out I can't and I have to go somewhere else. So Bed Bath & Beyond may have just wasted their money. I lost my little cookie, there we go. So can you use dynamic search ads in a crisis? Yes. But number one, be more liberal with the new pages and exclusions. Uh, and number two, I would recommend, you know, you can think of search like a question and answer engine that every search is a question and we're just paying to have the best answer. Um, things like curbside pickup, pick the questions that you actively wanna answer and don't let them get picked up by DSA. Make sure that you give a real and active answer ahead of time. Number three, if you're gonna see a theme, um, I would say do search query reports more frequently um, and be more conservative than you normally would with dynamic search ads. Uh, don't let them run too much because there's a lot of, uh, in a crisis, stuff will move too fast for them to pick it up. So we'll talk about bidding and budgets as this is probably what most people are the most concerned about. So this is a series of data from, again, a pretty normal apparel client. And this is their day parting data um, for, again, three months uh, that we've been in the crisis and the same time period from last year. Now, look, these, these aren't dramatic changes, but there are some interesting things here that we see spike out. Uh, so for example, uh, the commuter spike that we normally get where everyone is on their phones on the commute to work, it's little now, it's not really there anymore because you're commuting upstairs or to your kitchen table. So if you had that area in your campaigns, I'm gonna consider old school day parting as automation because it is. If you're bidding up 9 a.m. or you're bidding it down, uh, conversion rate isn't the same that it used to be. It's not as good. Uh, number two, uh, Friday and Saturday nights, which normally used to be a huge drop off in volume, now has a spike. So everybody who does their virtual Zoom happy hour is already starting to shop. So this is a good time now as opposed to a bad time. 
which is hilarious until I realized that I have like three cases of wine coming and it was because I did Quizzo on Friday night and then I decided I wanted more wine. Whoops. Um, number three, I was honestly thinking back and forth whether I should use this language, but it is what it is. Um, the curve flatten, meaning that basically everything that we saw for day parting and everything that we're looking at in our clients is shrinking, um, meaning that the spikes and drops are a lot less dramatic. So performance is a lot more consistent throughout the day as opposed to having a really good time and a really bad time. So I think the lesson to take from this is you have to look at the assumptions that you made before uh, whatever crisis we're in, and then look at the crisis in a vacuum because the performance in the crisis is going to be different than before and different than after. Other fun thing as we think about geo is uh, commuting and device behavior. So I talked about commuting a little bit. So this is a map of the Manhattan DMA. Um, so normally during the work week, you would see most volume is kind of concentrated in lower Manhattan because that's where everyone works but no one's going to work. So, you know, in a, normal, in a normal time, the morning would be, and the morning and daytime would be concentrated in lower Manhattan. Evenings would be more spread out and a little bit thinner and sort of cover the whole thing as people go home, go to their tiny little apartment, what have you. Now it's much more steady, it's much more stable, and there aren't those concentration pockets, especially not around Wall Street or downtown, because people aren't going there. So, on a related note, and frankly, I pulled this data in mass for all of our clients and the changes weren't that big, but when you go client by client, they're wacky. So take a look at your own performance, but I'd say on a blanket, what we're seeing is this is the first year over year that we've seen mobile volume shrink uh, because so many people are trying to avoid screen time and they're by their computers at home anyway. So why would you use a mobile device if you're not really mobile? I don't know. Um, Obviously we're seeing a rise in computer usage as a result and a huge rise in YouTube consumption uh, and OTT consumption. So that sort of strategy is really interesting. Um, tablets have remained kind of flat. Mine's still sitting over there and I still don't use it very much. Um, but again, you have to look at this data in a vacuum to figure out what it's gonna do and make sure that your old assumptions aren't broken. Probably the biggest question that most people have is can we still use smart bidding? Is it moving fast enough? Are automated bids okay? For most of our clients, the answer has been yes. But the caveat that I'll give is that our clients tend to skew what most people would consider enterprise. Um, we tend to work with larger clients. So in turn, we have a lot more data, so it kept up a little bit faster. So a good way to gut check it and give you an idea if bid automation will work in this time period is look at the last period of extreme volatile periods. So in most cases, what we found is the areas where a client didn't have smart bidding work or reverted back to manual or had to revert back to manual are people that also had trouble in their busiest season. So think of Black Friday. Did you have to turn off smart bidding on, there's no name for this, but the weekend between Black Friday and Cyber Monday, did you have to turn off smart bidding because it wasn't moving fast enough and it was overpaying? If the answer is yes, then you might not want to use it now or in the middle of a crisis. If the answer is no and it kept up just fine, it's going to keep up just fine in the future. Uh, number two, and this is something that people often forget, but when we were talking about how dramatic the spikes were and how fast they were, um, you know, we've seen scenarios or heard of scenarios where say you have a branded campaign and you set your budget to $1,000 because you want to make sure you capture every available piece of volume. That spike could happen at three in the morning and you will not see it. And you could very quickly spend $2,000 because engines decided they could double things. Um, but so these spikes can be really fast. So what we've done for most of our clients is rather than have a giant budget cap with a ton of headroom, um, knowing a spike could take advantage of it, is we lowered them closer to the moving average to make sure that if a spike happens, we won't accidentally spend a lot of money. Um, and instead, um, we'll set tons of alert systems so we know when those happen. And number three, when we're talking about bid automation, again, make sure that your data is airtight, especially inventory. There's nothing worse than getting 100 orders for a product that you have two of. So make sure that those things are moving super fast, that your site is reacting, 
that your site is giving true information and that you're communicating with your clients in a way that, or excuse me, with your customers in a way that sets their expectations well. Last but not least, we'll talk about messaging, uh, which is one of the more difficult things. So talked about this a little bit before. Swear if I see one more ad that says, we're here for you. No, you're not. You're an insurance company. You're there when something breaks. Um, I mean, look, this is maybe me, a bit of me projecting my desires on the world, but I think the world is probably sick about hearing about the crisis and is probably sick of hearing about how you're handling the crisis. I'm not saying behave like things normally are, but what I am saying is maintain your brand voice in whatever shape it may be. So if you were a goofy company before, you can be a goofy company in a crisis. Make sure that you hold true to who you are, but make sure that you do it in a way that, again, you're conscientious of, of what the world is going through. And again, talking about automation, automation is a couple of different shapes. So there's obviously purely automated extensions, but there's also extensions that you forget about and they show up sometimes, but not all the time. So the two on top are ones that, in my opinion, are pretty good. Uh, they stick to their brand voice. Uh, they have very cleverly uh, integrated what, you know, what they're doing to combat the crisis without being overt about it. So California Closets, biased as that's uh, one of our clients. Um, but so rather than booking an in-home consultation, they say book a virtual consultation. Perfect. Didn't have to change too much. Doesn't go too, too overt. Sticks with who they are. Uh, the TGI Fridays ad I think is great. Um, again, their, their messaging is, is kind of fun. It's on brand and it says, you know, it keeps their fun feeling uh, and, you know, says what they can offer. Uh, then there's ones that are a little bit more iffy. So I don't know why the haircut place is running ads. I'm pretty sure that they just forgot to turn them off. But I think the painting one is an interesting one where there's a lot of them where it's like, okay, schedule a free estimate, get a free consultation, uh, set up an appointment. Can you do appointments? Can you not? You have to make sure that you're presenting these things. So the first things you have to do with your copy, especially with RSAs, and extensions is number one, make sure that you're not being tone deaf or that you're ignoring questions that people might have. Number two, closely, closely, closely review your extensions, especially site links, snippets, um, things like that. There's a very high likelihood that you have a book and in-home appointment or 24 hour delivery or whatever buried somewhere in one of your extensions. So make sure that it's not there if it's not true in, in the crisis. Number three, and this is the way that I would think of basically all ad automation, is it okay if your ad personalization is wrong? If a person gets the wrong message, will the right message be okay? Or you know, will they get something that is completely off? That's a decision for you to make, um, but do your best to try and make an ad be wrong and make sure that it's still okay. And this is an interesting one too. Um, we encountered this as well where, you know, very often when you have a big sale, you will turn an ad off and turn another one back on uh, and you'll turn off your evergreens. Don't, um, ad reviews are slowed. So if you have automated ads to go dark and go live, make sure that you keep the old ones live. So the last thing that I will do in uh, this is weird because I'm quoting myself. Um, but, uh, you know, there was a post that went out actually this morning on Think with Google. Um, and look, the way that we're thinking of this and the way that we think of every crisis is there's no new normal. You can't look for things to return the way they were before. You can't look for stuff to, you know, be the same way it was last year because, I mean, honestly, it might be and it might not be. I don't know, but looking for normal means that A, you'll find it because confirmation bias as we covered before, and B, it's frankly just unrealistic. What we're looking instead is for data to normalize, and that's when our automation will really catch up and keep up and make sure that it stops kind of popping and dropping. So with that, 
uh, that's the end of my session. And I actually, I think I'm actually right on time. You're so, right on time. So let's, let's do a couple questions and then we'll wrap up and we'll give you your applause you deserve. <laughs> hey, stop. so there we go. do you have clients who are stopping smart bidding right now, who, who have relied on it and if, you know, you've said evaluate this, right? Do you have some are like enough or you're just like, hey, we're cutting this off? They're primarily that's happening when the fluctuate like for industries that are fluctuating, um, that are really, really volatile, um, where, you know, demand is spiking or, you know, if we have a client that's a marketplace, you know, where inventory moves really, really fast, that like demand for toilet paper is really high versus demand for XYZ. For clients that are either normal or are affected in a sort of predictable way, it's for the most part been fine. It's, it's kept you, doing what it was doing. All right. So some, the lazy way, right, of doing this, which sometimes is good, sometimes is bad, right? Is some are using the, the Google seasonal thing, right, where you can just say, hey, my, my expected conversion rates are 20% less and they're walking away. Good or bad to use right now? I wouldn't because um, that's, I mean, that's again, the seasonal thing was generally designed to be short term. It was designed to cover like three days a week. It was done, designed to black out like really obscure spikes. It's kind of assuming that the entire period is the same, which is what we covered before. It's not. It moves really, really fast. Um, so when you look at it in mass, it's a little iffy. Um, what I would instead recommend, and this sounds less lazy, but it's really not, just check your accounts every morning. See if yesterday looked normal or weird. If it looked weird, did bidding do what it was supposed to? If it did, you're fine. So the num so regarding messaging, last week the number stated 47% of people were sick of the we're with you messaging. Um, <laughs> I saw the numbers yesterday up to 51%, right? Are, are sort of done with the stick with us messaging stuff. So I loved your, your first example of like just virtual meeting, right? Be subtle yet be cognizant. Um, I think that's a, a really important takeaway. Um, any last thing you want to share with us before we wave goodbye to Aaron and, and we welcome uh, Jim Paulo, I believe, next? I mean, I'm not going any anywhere. last things there, Aaron? I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be here. But... Yeah, I know you're going to be here. And you'll be on chat some and you'll be on Twitter. So everyone can always find you. In I'll fact, why don't you throw place. your Twitter in the chat when we're done here so they know how to ping you there too. Yep, we will do. I mean, look, what I'll say for, for everyone is automation is not something to be scared of before a crisis. It's not something to be scared of, be scared of during a crisis. It's not something to be scared of after a crisis. What you have to understand is that automation has a especially Google automation has a pretty short memory. Um, it, obviously they look at all history, yada, 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 but realistically it's like a week to 30 days. So as long as the 30 day period that it's looking at is consistent and realistic with what you're expecting it to do, it should keep working. Um, but I mean, look, my, my biggest advice to everybody is understand what these tools do. Don't look at them as just, it's a hammer. It's going to hammer really well. Understand the factors that go in there, under, understand the factors that influence it, and then assess whether those factors are changing or reliable. All right. So I wish like, you know, Zoom, we had a virtual clap button or something, right? An icon, right? But so thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Yeah, and Aaron will be around. Clap. So feel free to hit him up in the chat. He's going to share his... Um, Twitter, uh, I can't big a little, a big a little, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> I only kind of remember all the Twitter names, right? There's way too many. There is one question that came in, but we're going to let you handle it afterwards because we need to keep moving.